Hi guys, in this video we're going to be looking at why we need Born Harbour cycles, generic Born Harbour cycles, finding the lattice enthalpy from Born Harbour cycles, finding other quantities, and then comparing theoretical and experimental data, and finally we're going to summarise. So what is a Born Harbour cycle, and why do we need them? Well, we can't measure the lattice enthalpy directly, as it's not possible to form one mole of ionic solid from its gaseous ions in the real world. This is where we use Born Harbour cycles. They're a type of Hess cycle, which, if you'll remember, show energy changes between different points in a reaction. Possibly look back to last year's work if you don't remember it. So with Born Harbour cycles, we can experimentally measure another path between gaseous ions and the ionic lattice, and then we use Hess's law to find the lattice enthalpy that we can't measure directly. So if you remember, with Hess's law, it states that if we go from reactants to products via one path, which we'll call path one, but we can go from the same start point to the same end point via a different route, which we'll call path two, then the enthalpy change along each of these paths is equal to each other. What Hess's law really says is that it doesn't matter which direction you take in a reaction, the total energy changes are the same. If you'd like a way of thinking about this in the real world, you can consider a mountain where instead of thinking about energy changes, instead what we're thinking about is a difference in heights. So if you're on a mountain, the path you take does not affect the total change in height. If one skier decides to go further up and take these three paths down, and the other skier goes straight down this black run here, then they've both travelled across the same distance in height if they meet again at the bottom. This is equivalent to it not mattering which direction through a reaction you take, each path will have the same enthalpy change. Before we look at any specific examples of how to construct Born Harbour cycles for reactions, let's look at the generic shape of a Born Harbour cycle for any given reaction. So we're interested in the energy released when one mole of ionic solid forms from its gaseous ion. This is the enthalpy change for this reaction shown here, where we've got some positive species X combining with some negative species Y to form the ionic solid XY, and we'll have an enthalpy change of delta LEH standard because it's one mole being formed under standard conditions. How a born harbour cycles work is to draw these lines which represent the energy levels at different points in the reaction. So this purple baseline represents the ionic solid, which for this generic example we're calling XY. The red line at the top represents the energy level of the gaseous ions. The difference in height represents the drop in energy as we go from one to the other. This is the lattice enthalpy that we're interested in. So now if we said we can't experimentally find this value, so we want to find another route from this point in the cycle to this point. So now let's consider how we can do this. One value that we can find experimentally is the enthalpy change of formation of the ionic solid. XYS. So remember that the enthalpy change of formation is the energy released when we take the elements in their standard states. So we'll imagine that's a solid for X and a diatomic gas for Y, and then you form the solid you want. This is usually much smaller than the lattice enthalpy, so it's shown by this much smaller drop in energy here, which we can label the change in enthalpy for formation. And then on the line, we write in the species we're interested in. So in this case, that's solid X plus half a mole of diatomic Y. At this stage, if we can create a path between the gaseous ions and the elements in their natural state, then we can use Hess's law to find the lattice enthalpy, as we'll know two different routes between the ionic solid and the gaseous ions. So to start this process, we should atomize the elements, as that makes them one step closer to being the gaseous ions. These equations show what we mean by atomization, where we take the elements in their standard state 
and convert them to monotonic gases. In the diagram for the Born Harbour cycle, we show two individual steps for the atomization of X and Y. So we start off with the elements in their standard states as before, and then firstly we'll atomize X. So that goes from being a solid into a gas, and Y will stay the same for this step. And then in the next step, it's Y that goes from being a diatomic gas to one mole of monatomic gas. Now we have X and Y in their monatomic gaseous form, we just need to think about giving them the correct charges to become the gaseous ions. So at this point we should put in the step for the ionisation of X. This is where we provide enough energy to separate an electron from X, leaving it as a positive ion. So again, because energy is going into the system at this point, it's represented by an upwards arrow in the born harbour cycle. We're transitioning from the gaseous atoms to having a 1 plus X ion, which is also in a gaseous state. And in this step, the Y doesn't change. And then the energy involved here is the enthalpy change of the first ionization, I1. So that's delta I1H standard. At this stage, don't forget to include the electron on this rung, because otherwise you've gone from having no charge on this step, you would have acquired a positive charge. What you've done is pulled an electron away. We can now combine this electron with the Y atom for our final stage to get to the ions that we need, and this step involves the electron affinity for our species Y. Remember electron affinity is where we take a mole of electrons, combine them with a mole of Y atoms, and form one mole of Y minus ions. So you'll remember from our video on enthalpy that this is an exothermic step. So energy is released from the system to the surroundings and we get a drop in our diagram. This is labelled by the change for the electron affinity and then H is normal for enthalpy and then this is our completed born harbour diagram. It takes a chemical system and then when there are endothermic changes, so energy is given to the system, we have these up arrows, so atomization and the first ionization energy are endothermic, and then when we have energy released from the system, we fall in height again on the diagram. So you can see that both the electron affinity for the first electron affinity and the lattice enthalpy are both exothermic. This is the point at which we can use Hess's law. So if we wanted to know the lattice enthalpy, which is the change from here down to here, we know it's the same as the other path between these two points. So if we added up all the enthalpy change from following through these paths here, then we would get the same value. We can measure all of these experimentally, and then that means we have a way to calculate the lattice enthalpy. This video is getting quite long, so we're going to split it into a couple of parts, and next time we'll talk about some specific Born Harbour calculations. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snaprovise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.